Okay, very good morning. Happy Friday, 22nd of November. Hope everyone is doing well. Thought I would kick off the briefing just a touch earlier than normal this morning because we do have some important economic data. So I'm going to try and whittle through the main headlines, give you the macro kind of fundamental overview, and then I'll come off the mic and we'll conclude the wrap. So um, again, we've got the manufacturing service flash PMI data coming out for the month of November, and it's going to start with the French numbers at 8.15, German at 8.30, and then obviously concludes with the Eurozone numbers at 9. We've also got the ECB president, Christine Lagarde, gives her first real speech of substance since coming in, what, three, three weeks ago or so as ECB president. So a lot of people are anticipating that potentially this could be one to watch, uh, given how she will... Uh, convey the current sentiment towards the economic environment and the current status of monetary policy. So she's speaking at 8.30 a.m. as well. So plenty to come in the next 35 minutes. So starting off then, let me just give you a quick overview of what the charts look like this morning. And things are relatively quiet. Um, just having a look here on my watch, the Dow, uh, well, the S&P finished down only about five points last night. So it's a relatively um, flat finish. The Dow was down just a touch, 0.2%, about 50 points or so. Uh, and that's really translated into the Asia Pacific session, not a great deal of movement to speak of. Uh, and so far this morning in, in the European UK Open, it's relatively flat. Major currency pairs are pretty much unchanged, a reflection of that in the dollar index. Uh, gold, just a touch higher, um, nothing really too much to speak of there with treasuries basically flat. WTI crude um, up about well, up from where we were in the low point about an hour ago, but overall down about 23 cents. But of course, I guess you need to put this into a bit of perspective from some of the recent days um, ranges that we've had. We've had such a roller coaster in crude oil prices, obviously, from where we were midweek to where we are now. That loss fully recovered uh, and pretty much tracking in the late U.S. session about the best levels that we've had so far in this week. And in fact, you'd have to go back, uh, as you can see on the charts here, all the way really till September to where we are at the moment. Uh, so despite some of the things that we've had throughout the week, we managed to recover some ground. Uh, but the biggest story remains that of this. And I did see this last night. Someone shared it. And I thought it was just a really good graphic uh, of really the last 48 hours in the world of financial markets. And this is the S&P 500 and looking at the, the trade war uh, and to make things really nice and clear, it's just got the red rectangles signifying when the market has dumped and then green when it's rallied. But it's just so dependent on just one, one theme. And that, of course, is the uh, this phase one trade deal between the US and China. You can see the bigger sell off the first one deal delayed into 2020 was on Reuters. And then you had um, the House is passed the vote to support Hong Kong protesters, again, gapping down at the reopening of trade. Then the Chinese vice premier, cautiously optimistic, we rally. And you can see here what's quite interesting, and it is, again, a reflection of that trade war cycle. Um, nearly everything in red, which has created a downward movement, has been almost US-led. Uh, the deal being delayed, the uh, Trump kind of saying that they're not stepping up to the plate, kind of the idea of then... Uh, voting to support in both the House and the Senate uh, the Hong Kong protests, which goes against kind of the, the will of any um, interference as far as the Chinese government are concerned. And then it's the Chinese that have been coming back uh, and been saying more of the positive side of things for the time being up until this last moment that we had. Uh, this would have been yesterday, um, having since recovered. But the point being is that it's been quite seesaw uh, and I guess one of the things here is that, I mean, sure, in hindsight, it looks great if you could have caught some of these moves. But, I mean, if you actually look at the broader range here, I mean, certainly on the downside, there's quite a distinct near double bottom from the, the move that we had late on, on the 20th and then early on the 21st. And, and so perhaps then really it's about assessing the risks associated with such uh, seesaw price movement. Uh, even as a global macro kind of trader, I think it's, it's, it can be quite difficult to try and stay on top of the, uh, the narrative when, when the headline noise is, is quite frequent. 
And so therefore, you know, if you're being a little bit more conservative, a little bit more prudent, it's just about identifying, well, what are the, the outer bound kind of ranges and then playing it accordingly, not unless there's something really definitive that breaks um, rather than getting involved and, and, and trying to just get potentially caught out on just a singular headline. The other thing which is quite common in this type of thing, although the, you know, if you X out that last rectangle, uh, and this is the way that um, news t tends to impact markets, is that you can see the first move and then the subsequent rectangles identifying the other price spikes, whether high or low, have got progressively smaller uh, and this is quite normal. It's almost, you know, people often refer to it as kind of this headline fatigue. You know, people um, generally just get it become almost desensitized to the, the, the number of comments that we see. Uh, very reminiscent of what we had in, in, in a much more longer term sense of what we have in Greece back in the sovereign crisis. First couple of times uh, and first few months really it was really market moving anytime Greece was mentioned and then progressively as it got spoken about more and more uh, it had lesser and lesser impact but um, just quite interested to see that in a very kind of microscope level of the last 48 hours of price action almost a similar sort of thing playing out um, of course bottom line you've got to be mindful of you know that the history would tell us that the way this has gone over the last 12 18 months is that Trump loves to kind of uh, put a, a departing shot across the, the bowel on a Friday afternoon just to kind of make it clear of how the land lies as far as the US are concerned uh, so definitely I'd be keeping an eye out on that. Um, the other thing that I saw Bloomberg were running this morning this was looking at um, the blue line the VIX and signifying that despite you know as, as dramatic as this looks you know, not to put into context that we are just a, a whisker off all-time highs and uh, percentage-wise, these aren't the biggest moves ever by any stretch of the imagination. And uh, as a matter of fact, the VIX is, is relatively suppressed at the moment. Now, they were talking about it in an article this morning in a slightly different way, but the way I was looking at it was more every time that the VIX tends to get down to this kind of 12 level. So you can see here back in April, that was the kind of lowest point that we had back in late July. It was the lowest point we've had. And in November here, when we've hit the all-time highs, the VIX has almost hit again a double test at around that 12 level to where we are at the moment. The one thing normally happens here, though, is that if you actually look over this period of somewhat calm, it's followed by a big spike. July, big spike. And so, uh, again, if you were looking at patterns here uh, it would suggest that it's only a matter of time before something most likelihood initiated by the trade war because that would have the greatest influence to really disrupt markets uh, we could be in for something uh, coming shortly and it wouldn't be I don't think too surprising the other things that we've had um, let me just blow this up a little bit so you can see the headlines more clearly um, this was looking at um, China Xi so the premier stressed the need for equality in phase one trade deals. So again, continuing to, feet, uh, to fit a fairly um, passive approach, somewhat optimistic, or I should say cautious optimism that was uttered by the vice premier the day before and being reiterated by the premier overnight. Um, we also had some comments out of a central bank, the PBOC advisor, um, who basically said that China still has room to adjust its fiscal, monetary and real estate policies if uncertainty over trade with the US generates further downward pressure in their domestic economy. Uh, so again, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a two-pronged uh, verbal uh, strategy at the moment from the Chinese, trying to be um, able to talk about the idea of that they want to get a deal done from a governmental level, but also um, being quite clear as well that that we're happy that we can withstand the storm if the US also don't step up to the plate and therefore at the same time you get commentary out of the PBOC saying look we've got plenty of options you could say that's almost an opposite case of what we have in many areas in the Western world where the kind of monetary ammunition box is relatively dry whereas in the Chinese from both a fiscal and monetary perspective, there's still, uh, or at least they would want it to appear that there's plenty of options still. 
The other thing was a research comment out of analysts at Goldman Sachs who've come out and, uh, and released their latest note, and they said an easing in trade tensions, a bottoming out of global manufacturing activity, and a continuation of cautious policy support will aid the stabilization in China's economy next year. So remaining quite bullish on the prospects that we've kind of hit peak trade war, if you like, in terms of where this, how these tensions are. Uh, but I'd say this is more of a reiteration of what they did say before. Um, one thing to be aware of, though, it's not all blue skies and plain sailing at the moment because Politico have released a latest report that's getting a little bit of airplay this morning at the European Open. And to give you the summary, it says that Trump administration officials are considering whether to start a new trade investigation against the European Union as the window closes for hitting Brussels with automobile tariffs according to multiple people briefed on the issue. So if you remember, uh, the US not only, you know, when we hit this new all-time high and the VIX has hit this lower bound at 12 most recently at the beginning of really November, and all this positive sentiment that we've had, well, it wasn't just a nearing of a phase one deal between the US and China, it was also the idea that the auto tariffs on Europe were gonna be delayed. But this article would suggest that even though that's the case, the Trump administration are potentially looking at other new trade investigations against the EU. So it could be something to just keep an eye on. Uh, depends really how much people want to circulate that as to how much impact it might have. I'd say the DAX this morning hasn't really had much of a reaction. The euro is a touch softer more recently, maybe worth keeping an eye. It's just broken through its uh, lower bound of the Asia Pacific session. But for the short term, the PMI data from the eurozone is going to be much more influential coming up shortly. Uh, on that note, just a couple of other final pieces and, and, and basically we'll wrap things up so we can focus on the data. Um, this was something out of Australia. Uh, and I just wanted to mention again, it was Goldman's note that's come out overnight. Um, and they've said that Australia's central bank, the RBA, will probably lower interest rates further in the near term, but is unlikely to deploy unconventional policies such as bond buying program in 2020. So Goldman's saying, sure, they might cut markets, remember, uh, a price for another cut sometime in the, towards really the middle of next year at this point, obviously subject to, to change, of course, as we go ahead in time. Uh, but Goldman saying that they don't think the RBA will deploy QE is kind of the opposite call of, at the moment, what the existing stances are for Citigroup and JP Morgan. So I thought it would warrant a mention here in the briefing. Um, other than the data, uh, this is the other big thing I want you guys to be aware of. So in about 25 minutes time, half past eight London, um, you're going to get Christine Lagarde give a keynote speech at Frankfurt European Banking Congress during the Euro Finance Week. Um, it is anticipated that this speech um, is going to be one of which where her first real um, commentary on the economic situation, on monetary policy uh, and so on is going to be commented on. So definitely this could be a market mover. Uh, this is kind of as well the first time that she's going to give her more formal uh, speech of importance in her new capacity as the president and although this is one of the, the strongest skills and assets that she has is her ability uh, to deliver speeches in a fairly confident and eloquent way obviously it's the first one as the ECB president so we'll be watching it with some great interest um, interestingly she speaks this morning and then they've got scheduled Louis de Guindos who's the vice president of course of the ECB he's going to be speaking later on this afternoon uh, different event he's over in New York but I think quite a subtle strategy here from the ECB they kind of got de Guindos who's been on the scene for a long time was a VP under Draghi and so just in case Lagarde makes a mistake or is misinterpreted uh, de Guindos can do the, the cleanup job later on this afternoon so again that kind of classic central banking strategy um, data wise couple of uh, things to have a look at and hopefully we can finish in good time for the French data you'll remember last time we had the the, the PMI data it was quite it was quite a tricky one to trade because you remember we had this massive um, service print on the French number markets rallied and then the, the man, then the German manufacturing came out and then the market pulled back again so these are flash readings these definitely are uh, the market moving ones because again these aren't finals so France at 815, 
Germany at 8.30. Remember, it's kind of more service-based for France that could be key. Can it maintain that momentum from the prior reading? Uh, the prior one being a move back to around 53, which analysts are expecting to remain constant at that level. And then the key one, the metric, is the German manufacturing flash PMI. Um, that's expected to see a mild improvement to 42.9 from 42.1, but still, as you can see, in sharp contractionary territory for the time being. Um, we then get the UK services PMI as well, um, although unlikely to move the needle too much for um, the Great British Pound, given the overall focus on the build-up for the general election, the service PMI data is probably one of the singular most important data points that we do have. Um, the lower bound of that range for today's um, service PMI in the UK is for 50. Well, actually, excuse me, the expectation is for 50. The lower bound is for 49.7. So again, a movement, a dip into um, negative territory could be interesting. Uh, you've got yesterday's low print trading only around 20 pips away from current price in cable at the moment. Um, and then into the afternoon, you get the US version of the PMI data. You've got University of Michigan, but that's the final reading, so probably less a significant. Speaker-wise, other than those mentioned, that's really it for the day as far as um, major events are concerned. You do have the Bund Bobble Shats November futures options expiries today as well, later on towards the close. Um, but just going into, obviously, as I've been talking, I have seen um, a little bit of a bump up here in the equity index futures. So I would imagine, well, let's just have a look how the DAX has been moving. It's been a, quite a graduated move. So here, I mean, obviously, as I deliver a briefing, I can see Twitter and the headline scroll. There's nothing immediate that jumps out. So one of the things here is that if you actually put let's say the DAX on a one minute, and this is the only time I'd ever look at a one minute chart. I can see here from the movement that, it's, that this is a trend and it's unlikely to be a one fundamental headline. Because if it were, then instead of rallying in a sequence of say eight, nine candlesticks showing progressive price movement, if it was a headline spark price, it would have just been one straight candle. So it's probably more, you can see that bigger, more accentuated move there coming around that level uh, on that candlestick and you can see that's kind of towards the upper bound of the price range and you can see quite a clear level so probably technically just helping bump that price a little higher uh, such as how uh, the DAX tends to move much more volatile of course as a product. All right guys I'm going to leave it at that uh, and wrap things up wish you a great weekend uh, as I said Sam not here today so Tommaso will be covering him on his desk so any of the guy live guys at home who have any questions please direct them to Tommaso. Thanks very much and enjoy your weekend.